Hello everybody and welcome to another audiobook by me, Ozone. Today we're going to be reading Sea Bonnies. We're going to go straight on from Friendly Face, which is an awesome story, to hopefully another banger. Uh, this is my first time reading it, of course, you're going to get my full reaction. And uh, yeah, this is Sea Bonnies. Let's get straight into it, I cannot wait. Mott lingered at the edge of the arcade in Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria and contemplated why he still liked this place so much. Was it the decor, the food, the animatronics? No. The truth was that Freddy's, bright, loud, and always over the top, was just a fun place to be. He turned and surveyed the dining area stretching out from the arcade. Even the parents were having a good time. Technically, he should have been growing out this place, but Freddy's had a way of getting under the skin. Mott? Mott looked down at Rory, his spastic little brother. Can we get more tickets? Rory asked. I always beat better air hockey. I need a do-over. Yo, is that Ben from Into the Pit? That's, that's cool. Mott reached out to ruffle Rory's bright red hair. Predictably, Rory, who recently turned seven and was too grown up for things like hair ruffling, darted out of Mott's reach and said, Mott, in a way that turned one syllable into three. It would be like, Mott. Okay. <laughs> Mott laughed and pulled a wad of dollar bills from his jean pocket. Uh, go beat the pants off him. Rory grinned, grabbing the money and took off. On the stage that ran the length of Freddy's dining room, Fred Frazbear and his cohorts, Bonnie and Chica, began a new song. A spinning disco ball overhead started spraying beams of yellow, red, green and purple light all over the pizzeria. Mott tapped his foot and began singing along under his breath. Mott! A ghoul girl called out. He turned to look at the packed tables. A couple of four and five year olds bumped into him as they went racing past. He smiled. Had he run around non-stop like that when he was their age? If he had, he could understand his mum's claim that he was responsible for 90% of the wrinkles forming on her still young face. Over here, the girl called again. He saw a slender, pink-nailed hand waving from a table a few feet away. It was Teresa, one of the popular girls in his class. He grinned at her, glanced once to check on Rory, and then sauntered ov over uh, Freddy's black and white checkered floor. Teresa shared a red cloth-covered pizza and soda-laden table with a man and a woman who had to be their parents. They all shared the same warm brown, almost amber eyes, although neither parent had Teresa's gorgeous smile. Her parents were turned away from her, talking animatedly with another couple at the next table. Mott heard something about golf and the cost of airfare. Mott turned his attention to Teresa. Friendly, smart and petite, Teresa was what his mum called a catch. Though they shared English and algebra classes, they hadn't talked much outside, outside class. Still, she always smiled at him in the hallways. Hey, Teresa. Hi, Mott. Are you here alone? Teresa gestured at the empty chair next to her, and Mott took it. A ponytailed server on roller skates zipped past with a fresh pizza. Aromas of tomato, basil, and cheese teased Mott's nose. His mouth watered. He hadn't eaten before he and Rory came here, figuring they'd get a pizza right away. But Rory had been obsessed with the game since they arrived and they hadn't ordered anything yet. Mott was getting so hungry that even the sickly sweet blue frosted birthday, birthday cake that sat near the stage was starting to look good. No, he said, I'm here with my little brother. He's friends with the birthday boy. Same here, my little brother too. Which one is yours? Mott asked, mainly because he had no idea what else to say. Teresa pointed at a boy with dark curls, <laughs> dark curls, uh, dancing with a bunch of little kids up next to the stage. Yours, she said. He looked over at the arcade. Rory's bright hair made him easy to spot. He and Ben had left their air hockey table and were charging this way. Rory probably wanted more money for tokens. Wow, really? He doesn't look like you, Teresa said. Mott wasn't sure what to say to that, so he just shrugged. But she was right. Rory got his red hair from their mother. Mott had their dad's plain brown hair, thankfully. Rory with tufts of red that refused to lie down properly on his head, his over-large eyes and mouth and his face full of freckles, was always going to be the kind of goofy looking. Mott, on the other hand, had been getting girls' stares long before he wanted to. When he turned 13 a few months before, he finally began to welcome all that attention. According to his mum, he was objectively good looking. 
The components of this assessment apparently were his naturally wavy hair, his hooded dark brown eyes, his strong chin, and his great teeth. In the last couple of months, he'd also shot up a few inches, and he'd started working out. His shoulders were getting broad. He was beginning to see what his mum saw. Apparently, girls like Teresa were seeing it too. Yo, so, <laughs> this is like the opposite of to be beautiful. To be ugly. <laughs> Don't let it go to your head, his mum had told him. If you do, I'll ground you for the rest of your life. Smiling at the memory, he said to Teresa, On a good day, I'll admit Rory looks like our mum. On a bad day, I'd tell him he was left on our doorstep by sea monkeys. Oh, sea monkeys, okay, okay. Rory raced up to the table just in time to hear what Mott had said. I was not, he shouted. Then he stuck out his hand. I want more tickets. Mott sighed and dug in his pocket for a few more dollars. He had paid several hundred dollars to make Rory go away so he could keep talking to Teresa. Rory took the money uh, Mott held out and ran off without saying thank you. Teresa laughed, then made a face. I hate sea monkeys. Mutt laughed too. Exactly. Creepy little things, he winked. The real ones, not my brother. Teresa shivered. I know what you mean. The real ones are like centipedes with tentacles and tails. Sounds absolutely disgusting. Freddy and his band subdued <laughs> into another corner or another co cover of a popular song, this one with a rocking beat. Teresa scooted her chair closer to Mott. This is a good song, don't you think? Mott nodded. I do, but I think I like this group's ballads better. He named another song by the same group who'd originally done this one. Teresa bounced in her seat. Oh yeah, that's a really good one. You like ballads? I'm learning to play the guitar, and that's what I like to sing. I'd love to hear you sing sometime, Mott said. Teresa beamed at him. They spent the next several minutes talking music, and Mott had pretty much forgiven... Uh, sorry, forgotten where he was until he glanced up and saw Rory galloping over, bouncing off a couple other few little kids and two tables as he came. He was grinning wildly, and he held up what looked like a new toy, something in bright coloured cardboard and plastic packaging. Rory was going so fast that when he got to the table, he ploughed right into Mott and started to lose his balance. Mott grabbed his brother's arm and kept him upright. Look what I got, Mott! Rory half yelled, half screamed. He was only a few inches from Mott now, and Mott winced at the excessive decibel level. As often he, as he often did, he wished Rory had a volume control he could dial down. Rory's blaring announcement had gotten Teresa's and her parents' attention. They all smiled at Rory as Mott asked, with as much enthusiasm as he could muster, What did you get? Rory started waving around his treasure. He waved it so rapidly that Mutt still couldn't tell what it was. He frowned, trying to read the words on the waving package. Sea bonnies, Rory said. I got sea bonnies. Look. He kept waving the package. I'm trying to look, Mutt said. He reached out and snatched the package. Rory jumped up and down like he was on an invisible pogo stick. Mutt focused on the package in his hand. Against a black checkered background, bright red letters announced that the package contained... Astounding live sea bonnies, under the words, the image of a seriously disquieting little purplish blue creature that appeared to be a cross between a sea monkey and a rabbit, was encircled by a bright blue blob of what was supposed to, what was probably supposed to be water. Next to the image, the package promised contains everything you need to grow and nurture your own sea bonnies. Beneath that, plastic sheathing covered four packets, designed to start your own healthy colony of happy sea bonnies. There were two packets of sea bonnies live eggs, one of sea bonnie water purification powder and one of sea bonnie super duper growth food at the bottom of the packaging. Bright blue letters proclaimed, guaranteed to live for three years. Haha, <laughs> guaranteed. I bet, I bet they're not. Uh, Mott made a face and looked at Rory. Really? Rory was still hopping up and down. Now he giggled and shouted, You said sea monkeys left me on the doorstep. Not sea monkeys. Sea bonnies. What? Oh, right. Uh, Rory let loose with one of his high-pitched laughs. He clearly thought he was hilarious. He spun in a gleeful circle. Now I can have some of my real brothers and sisters around. He laughed some more, quite pleased with himself. Mott shook his head. He felt Teresa leaning in behind him, and he showed her the package. Ew, she said. He nodded in agreement. 
Rory plucked the package from Mott's hand. They're awesome. Sure they are, Mott said. As soon as Mott and Rory got home, Rory darted into the kitchen to find their mother, who was tearing up lettuce for a salad. Beef stew simmered on a six-burner Viking range that was his mum's pride and joy. She loved to cook. Rory showed his mum the sea bonnies package and started talking non-stop as he climbed up onto one of the wood stools in front of the granite-covered island where she worked. Their mum set the lettuce aside and began chopping tomatoes and cucumbers for the salad. For one blissful moment, all Mott could hear was the faint hum of the fan above the range, the intermittent tap of his mum's knife against the cutting board, and the delicious stew bubbling. But then Rory started jabbering, and all Mott could hear was his chatterbox of a brother. Rory, ra Rory waved his sea bonnies package under his mother's nose. She blinked at it, but kept working on the salad. Rory didn't seem to care. Sea bonnies are basically like sea monkeys, but they're genetically engined to look like Bonnie. You know, Bonnie from Freddy's, Rory said. Mott and his mother exchanged a smile at Rory's version of genetically engineered. Rory kept talking. They're super cool looking, and Fazbear Entertainment only came out with them last month. That's what Ben said. He usually buys all the new stuff, but his parents wouldn't let him get any sea bonnies because they said pewter might eat them, and they didn't think that would be good for pewter, and that wouldn't be good for the sea bonnies either. He giggled wildly. Mott looked at his mum over the top of Rory's head. He shrugged. Wearing her usual stay-at-home clothes, black yoga pants and a baggy white shirt, his mum brushed a strand of red hair from her blue eyes. She scratched her freckled nose and smiled. Pewter is the family cat, right? His mum said. Hmm? Oh, yeah, Rory said. Don't you think I should get a bigger fish tank now that Fritz is going to have friends? Oh, no. Oh, no, there's a child called Fritz. Okay. Oh, God, this is going to change everything, I bet. Wait. So, huh, that's, that's strange. Because we've had like a, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that right now. I might talk about it in the theory video. I mean, I know the small one fits on my desk and the sea bonnies can help Fritz keep me company while I do homework and colour and stuff. But, oh, wait, Fritz is a fish. <laughs> I just realised Fritz is a fish. Never mind. But if we got me a big tank with a stand, I could put it on the other side of the room, under the window. Oh, no, wait. What if we got a huge one, and we put it in the living room? Oh, no, wait. Then I wouldn't have any in my room. Wait, then I wouldn't have them in my room. I think I want them in my room. Maybe I could get more, and we could get two tanks, and... While Rory talked, and Ma Mott tried not to listen to him, their mother wiped her hands on a dish towel. She stepped over and gently put her hand over Rory's mouth. Uh, take a breath, sweetie, she said. It's genetically engineered, Mott said in the blessed quiet that suddenly filled the kitchen. Not genetically engined. His mum gave him a look and shook her head. He rolled his eyes. She crossed the shiny wood floor to the stainless steel refrigerator and opened it to grab a bottle of salad dressing. Do sea bonnies have the same water temperature requirement that Fritz has? She asked. Rory said, huh? May I see the package? Mott asked Rory. Rory shrugged and handed it over. Mott scanned the instructions on the back of the package. He frowned. Isn't it 74 degrees now? His mother nodded. Oh wait, 74 degrees. Isn't that the temperature in FNAF VR? Right, a perfect 74 degrees. <laughs> Thank you for working at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Is that the temperature? I feel like it is. Huh, interesting. Oh, because that's the temperature that Remnant used to be at. So could sea bonnies be, like, alive from the souls of children? No, I'm, I'm joking. I don't know. The water needs to be 75 to 81 degrees for them to hatch. Then it can go back down. I wonder if cranking it up to, like, 78 or something would be okay for a goldfish for the 24 hours it takes to hatch the sea bonnie eggs. Maybe you can research that after dinner, his mum said. Mott shrugged. Sure, why not? That's what all the cool kids do on the Saturday nights. She laughed. No, that's what all the cool kids wish they were doing. Instead, they're going to boring things like movies and parties. I feel sorry for them, Mott said. Rory, who had been examining his sea bonnies with great pride and joy, suddenly pointed at a spot on the package. What's that word? Mott looked under his brother's dirty index finger. Colony. What's a colony? 
Not to let his mum take that one. When she finished defining the word, Rory screwed up his face and announced, I want an empire, not a colony. That's bigger, right? Maybe I should get another package of them. One package is enough, his mum told him. Rory squinted and took a deep breath, in clear preparation for a loud rebellion. Mott spoke quietly. You can call it whatever you want, you know. Rory tilted his head. I can? Absolutely, Mott and his mum said in unison. Uh, after dinner, and after determining that Fritz wouldn't be harmed by a day or so of 28 degree water, Mott helped Rory get his tank set up for the sea bonnies. Rory's tank was small, maybe 16 inches by 10 inches or so. It held 5 gallons. More water than Fritz needed, but Mott thought Fritz always looked content in his domain. Mott idly wondered what Fritz would think about the soon-to-be interlopers. Did fish think? Lifting the tank's lid and waiting while, while Rory said hello to Fritz, Mott opened the sea bonny packaging. Okay, first step, he told Rory, is to put this in. He handed Rory the packet of water purifier. At Rory's insistence, he read the ingredients, salt, some kind of water conditioner, and some brined shrimp eggs. That's all we can do today, Mott, ho Mott told a frustrated Rory when his little brother wanted to dump all the p other packets in too. The instructions say to wait 24 hours, then we'll put in the eggs, those with the genetically engineered eggs. Why do we have to wait? Rory scowled. Mott shrugged, because the packaging says so. He didn't bother telling Rory that the whole process was weird. He read the contents of the eggs packet, and he was surprised to see it also contained ye yeast, borax, soda, salt, and blue dye. What about this? Rory asked, holding up the food packet. Mott referred to the instructions. That goes in after the eggs hatch. The food packet contained more yeast and some more, uh, spirulina. It would have been, it, it would have to be added every few days. Because Mott didn't trust Rory not to dump everything in the tank at once, he took the packets when he left Rory's room. Rory protested, but when he started to throw a tantrum, then Mum appeared to smooth things over. Mott felt bad that she had to intervene. Their dad was a commercial airplane or airline pilot who was often away, which meant Mum had to run the house and do most everything at home. She also worked full-time as an event planning firm and was trying to start her own company in her spare time, of which she had little, to compound matters. Most of the events she planned happened in the evening, and she had to be there to oversee them. Mott wasn't sure when his mum slept, and even with all that, she never acted annoyed when she interrupted. When she was interrupted. Mum, Mott said, I'll get him ready for bed. Go rest. Sure, she asked. Sure. You're a good son, his mum said. I know, he laughed. With just a little wheedling, Mott got Rory into the bathroom to brush his teeth. While he brushed, Rory chatted about school and his friends and the new puppy that Danny and his family had gotten a few weeks before. Toothpaste shot all over the place as Rory talked. Used to, his, used, to this routine, eh, used to this routine, Mott wiped down the counter and the floor. Eventually, Rory split the remainder of his toothpaste into the sink. Mott used a wet washcloth to wipe Rory's face. Rory wriggled out of his reach. I want a puppy, Rory said. When's dad coming home? He's doing non-stops this week, Mott said. He'd opted for answering the second question first. It was easier. I think he'll be home for a few days next week. Maybe he'll get us a puppy when he's home, Rory said. Maybe mum will get us a puppy when you demonstrate a little responsibility. Rory twisted his lips in concentration. How do I do that? Mott considered what he could get away with. Well, maybe if you cleaned up your room, didn't yell so much and stopped interrupting me and mum whenever, Rory shouted, No! I know what I can do! Shh! Rory lowered his voice, just to just above normal volume. I can help Danny with the pup. The pup? Mutz repeated. That's the puppy's name, his dad kept asking. Where's the puppy? And his mum said that they might as well call him that. His whole name is the puppy. But they call him... Da pup. Danny likes to follow da pup around and say over and over, What's up, da pup? Rory giggled, gleef, gleef, uh, Rory giggled gleefully. Mott laughed. He couldn't help it. Rory was a lot of annoying things, but he was also entertaining as all let get out. Apparently, so were Danny and his family. Okay, 
Mott said. Let's get you to bed. Following Rory into his room, Mott shut Rory's bedroom door so Rory's jibber-jabber didn't bother their mother. Now Danny's bugging his parents for a kitten, Rory went on. He wants to name it the cat or the kitten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Why is that so hilarious? Rory launched himself toward his bed, spun in midair and landed on his back. He kicked his legs in the air like an upturned beetle and let out another trill of giggles. Where are your PJs, goofus? Mott asked. Rory sat up, his eyes dancing. He, grab he grabbed his pillow. Under the bed, doofus. Mott bent over to look under the bed and a pillow hit him in the side of the head. He rose to find Rory looking at the ceiling and whistling. Mott glanced around as if searching for something. Hmm. A pillow just hit me in the head. I wonder where it came from. Rory giggled. Did it come from under the bed? Mott asked. He stuck his head under the bed and spotted green and yellow dinosaur patterned PJs. As he reached for them, another pillow struck his shoulders. Mott whipped his head out from under the bed and jumped to his feet. Feigning shock and outrage, he dropped the PJs on the bed. Another one? Is there an invisible pillow thrower in the room? He, he whirled in a circle, wearing a fierce expression as Rory giggled louder. Show yourself, you pillow-throwing milksop! Mott leaned over and picked up the thrown pillows. I'll beat you in a fair fight if you have the metal. Or metal. I, I don't know how you say that word. <laughs> he struck a warrior pose, both pillows raised. Rory, struggling against the rising tide of giggles, shouted, What's a milk shop? And why does he need metal? Oh, there we go. <laughs> nice one. Mott cocked his head. Hark! Me thinks these questions are a misdirect. He glowered at Rory. Dost thou do the pillow throwers bidding, young lad? Are thee in cahoots with the Nambi Pambi? Rory laughed so hard he snorted. He reached for the only remaining pillow on the bed. Mott turned his back to Rory and pretended to look for the pillow thrower again. The third pillow hit him in the back. Outrageous, he bellowed, leaning to pick up the latest pillow. He rotated to face Rory. I've got no choice but to unleash my retaliation upon thine own countenance, young minion of the invisible pillow thrower. Making sure he didn't throw too hard, Mott fired all three pillows at Rory, who dove under the covers squealing and laughing. Mott fell on him and started tickling him. Rory shrieked and, louded laugh and laughed louder. Dost thou surrender? Mott asked. Rory gasped. Yes, yes. His breath smelled like his peppermint toothpaste. Mott stopped tickling his brother. Rory, his face flushed, his eyes wet with happy tears, grinned up at Mott. You didn't answer my question. Mott reached for the PJs, which had landed on the floor again during the roughhousing. What? Oh, you mean uh, milk sop and uh, metal? Rory nodded. Mott handed Rory his PJs. Put these on. A milk sop is someone who is indecisive or doesn't have courage. It comes from how little kids used to sop up milk with their bread. Rory frowned, then nodded. I like that word. And it's M-E-T-T-L-E, -T -T not M-E-T-A-L, Mott said as Rory pulled on his PJ top. Metal, he spelled it again. Means the ability to cope with difficulties, someone who can bounce back from an attack easily. Rory exchanged his jeans for his PJ pants. That's another good word. I agree, Mott said. Let's get you under the covers. Rory yawned and crawled under the covers, head first. Mott rolled his eyes. Turn around, goofus. Rory giggled from under the covers. He rotated and he and his towel tousled head appeared. What's Nampy Pampy? Or Nambi Pambi? Mott helped Rory get situated in bed. It's another word for milksop, but it also means someone without much strength. I'm not a mamby pamby or a milksop, Rory said. No, you aren't, Mott agreed. That was adorable. That was a very adorable scene. <laughs> adorable. Mott got home late on Monday evening. He and his two best friends, Nate and Lyle, that's a really stupid name... Oh my god. I mean, if you're called Lyle, if someone's watching this and you're called Lyle, I think that's how you say it, then I apologise. I Nothing against you, but like, how do you pronounce it? Is it Lyle? I'm going to say Lyle, but hopefully it is Lyle. Because uh, it looks like Kyle, but without the K and with an L. 
uh, Nate and Lyle who had to work on a science project and they'd met at Nate's house to work on it. Nate's dad, Dr. Tabor, aka Dr. T, was a pediatrician who had been Mott's doctor since Mott was a baby. Nate and Mott had become friends because they'd met Dr. They'd met at Dr. Tabor's office when they were about two. Dr. T's wife, an engineer, had an important meeting that day, so Dr. T had brought his son to work with him. Nate and Mott had taken over the blocks in the waiting room playing area, building an impressive thought fort that none of the other kids in the waiting room were allowed to touch. Dr. T had told Mott's mum that the boys' friendship clearly was meant to be, and suggested the parents get together for dinner while the kids had a playdate. Or at least, that's what Mott's mum had told him. He didn't remember any of it. All he knew was that his, pens, uh, his, uh, his parents were good friends with Nate's parents, and he was good friends with Nate. His earliest memory of Nate was the two of them trying to climb up on a counter to steal freshly baked cookies. They both ended up in Dr. T's office with con contusions and mild burns from the hot cookie sheets. Not that Mott remembered that either. He just remembered the chair ladder they'd built, and he remembered a lot of pain. Over the years, Dr. T had become like a dad to Mott. Dr. T believed that work and home life should be properly balanced, so he opened his clinic near the neighbourhood, close to the end of the greenbelt that ran past the back of Mott's house. Dr. T started work really early, but he never worked late, never worked weekends, and he was always ready and willing to, pay or to play or help with school. Tonight, he was helping the boys get started on their science project, which was a study of the effects on antibiotics on microorganisms. Having access to a doctor came in handy. Dr. T had been given a small amount of four types of antibiotics. Oh, for goodness sake, the writers just put this in here so that I can't say them. Okay. Penicillin. I know that one. Streptomycin. Oreomycin. And teramycin. He'd also gotten a strange... Uh, sorry, a syringe, a petri dish, flasks and beakers, and some pipettes. Mott and his friends had been tasked with getting everything else they'd need. A potato, agar, dextrose, distilled water, garden soil, and pens that would write on glass. When they'd complained about their agar and the dextrose, What in the heck are those? Nate had asked his dad. Dr. T had gotten them too. I know a lot about agar. We, we did a lot of experiments in school with agar, where you, uh... You, like, put it on a door handle and see how many germs are on it. It's kind of weird. Dr. T and Nate had already done 99% of the experiment. Lyle was bored out of his mind and mostly tried to make music with the pipettes and the beakers. Mott wasn't bored, but he was puzzled by the complex process. What with, his, what, what with this being heated and that being mixed in? Thanks to Dr. T, he did eventually understand what they were doing, and he was looking forward to see what microorganism colonies grew in the petri dishes that they set next to the heat register in Nate's house. They had bets going on which antibiotics would keep the, two, the colonies from growing. Two cheeseburgers and a milkshake on penicillin, Nate said. I'll take that bet, Lyle said. If we throw in a couple large fries, how about you, Mott? I'm in with Nate, Mott said. Lyle rolled his eyes. Well then, if you're wrong, it had better be two milkshakes. You're going down, Nate said. Mott laughed with his friends and said goodnight. He biked home a little after nine, which was when it was dark. When he pulled his bike into the garage, Rory met him at the door leading into the kitchen, flailing around in excitement. Come look, come look. Mott followed his exuberant brother up the stairs and down the long hallway, pausing only to drop his backpack in his own room. When they went into Rory's room, he pointed and stumped back and forth in front of his desk, as if performing a ceremonial dance on the strewn clothes and toys all over his blue sh shag rug covered floor. Look, he shouted. Mott stepped over a plastic cement truck, a cardboard castle and two spaceship models to stand before Rory's fish tank, which sat on Rory's desk, surrounded by a clutter of school books, colouring books, puzzles and crayons. Even partially hidden by all the piles, it was clear that the tank no longer contained just water and fritz. It was now filled with tiny, wriggling shapes. Mott leaned over to get a better look. He immediately wished he hadn't. Straightening, Mott rubbed away the goosebumps that had just erupted all over his forearms. Oh, this is just wrong. Are they great? Rory asked. Mott rolled his eyes. You're, serious, you're a seriously weird little kid. What are you? Part sea monster? Are you part... He gulped loudly. Creep from the deep beyond? Rory stumped 
uh, stop stomping in glee and turned to frown at Mott. What do you mean by that? Although he'd leaned away from the tank, Mott hadn't been able to pull his gaze from the disgusting things swimming around in the goldfish uh, in the tank. The sea bunnies had hatched. Dozens of them. No, make that hundreds. They looked like semi-translucent, fleshy, pale, bluish purple rabbits with tiny black eyes and almost microscopic furry tentacles lining their bodies. From what Mott could tell, they appeared to propel themselves through the water using their misshapen rabbit ears. Rory tugged on the hem of Mott's brown polo shirt. Huh? Mott said. Why did you say that? Why did you say I'm part sea monster? Rory punched Mott's leg hard enough to make Mott grimace. That was mean. Ignoring his brother's upset, uh, Mott pointed to the sea bodies. Do you actually like these things? He asked. Rory turned to look at them, his hurt feelings forgotten. He grinned. Sure, they're super cool, yo. Mott crossed his arms. Rory, they're disgusting. They are not. Rory kicked out at Mott and barely missed Mott's shin. That's not nice to say stuff like that. You're going to make them feel bad. He reached out to the fish tank and stroked the glass like he was trying to soothe his mutant pets. Whatever, Mott scoffed. He started to turn away and leave the room, but an abrupt movement in the tank yanked his gaze back to the sea bonnies. He lifted his eyebrows. The sea bonnies had moved, in a giant cluster, to where Rory's hand had brushed against the side of the tank. Fritz still swam lazily at the far side of the tank, but the sea bonnies were all together near the glass under Rory's hand. It was like they were responding to his gesture. It's like one of those uh, plasma balls, you know? <coughs> the, the, like the plasma... They are called plasma balls, aren't they? Yeah, it's like one of them. It follows the movement on the glass. The goosebumps reappeared on Mott's arms. He shook his head, annoyed with himself for being unnerved by tiny deviant uh, brain shrimp. Their movement must have been some kind of reflexive response to motion or shadow, he figured. He turned toward the door to Rory's room. Apologise, Rory said. Mott stopped and gave Rory a look. To you or your swimming freaks there? Rory put both his fists on his skinny hips. Both! Mott laughed at his brother. A burbling sound came from the fish tank and Mott's attention returned to it. He blinked and stared. Although Fritz still floated toward the back of the tank, the sea bonnies had shifted so they were lined up in a disturbingly ordered formation along the front of the fish tank. He couldn't tell for sure because they were so small, but from where he stood, it looked to Mott like all the sea bonnies were facing forward, looking at him. Mott swallowed hard and took a step back. Obviously, the sea bonnies weren't in any sort of formation and they weren't looking at him. That wasn't possible. Mott, say your story, Rory yelled. What's going on in here? Mott turned to see his mum standing in the doorway of Rory's room. She had a blue laundry basket full of fo folded clothes propped against her waist. Rory charged over to her and threw his bony arms around her thighs. He spewed out his grievance so fast that his words bunched up together. Mott called me a sea monster and he insulted my sea bonnies. He said they were disgusting and he was mean and he, would, and he didn't apologise. Damn it, I messed up at the end. No! <laughs> Mott's mum used her free hand to pat Rory's so shoulder. She looked at Mott over the top of Rory's head and raised one eyebrow. Mott knew that look. It said, you're not wrong, but can you humour your little brother? He sighed and nodded. Rory? Rory sniffed and turned to frown at Mott. Mott squatted to look Rory in the eye. I'm very sorry I insulted you and your friends. I was just kidding, but I shouldn't have kidded you that way. He noticed that Rory had a smudge of chocolate at the corner of his pouty lips and several bl blonde crumbs on the front of his green and blue striped shirt. Striped shirt, ooh! <laughs> his breath smelled like the chocolate chip cookie he'd nearly, he'd clearly snuck from the kitchen. Oh, aw, Rory is so cute in this. Mott reached out and cleaned up both crumbs and chocolate with his thumb. Rory squirmed away and said begrudgingly, It's okay. Mott glanced at the sea bonnies. He realised that he was, checkingly, uh, he was checking them because he wanted to see if his apology had modified them any more than it had his brother. They were swimming around in the tank, exactly as you would, you would expect sea monkey-like creatures to do. He must have imagined their earlier behaviour. But why would he have done that? What, was he that freaked out by the abnormal little creatures? He rotated back to his mother. Can I help with any of that? He waved a hand at the laundry basket. She flashed him a smile. 
I've got it. Go ahead. I assume you only worked on science at Nate's, right? Mott nodded. She was right. He still had more homework to do. Mott started to leave the room, but he hesitated when he heard his name being whispered. He looked back at his mum, who was tucking socks into one of the drawers in Rory's dresser. Did you say something? He looked at her. Uh, sorry, he asked her. She looked over at him. Nope. Oh no, <gasps> I know what's happening. He stepped into the hallway and he heard it again. A whisper. Mott. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh.